Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. It is Wednesday, the 5th of January. Um, we are jumping back into consideration of the, the initial redistricting bill. And um, committee members, you'll have to bear with me for a moment, but I'm going to do a brief explanation of where we're at because I understand that it could be quite <laughs> unnerving to people if they think we're uh, passing a redistricting plan on day two of the of the legislative session. Um, so for folks who aren't familiar with, uh, with how the House does its redistricting, we are required by law to pass an initial bill um, that is sort of a, a proposal to get out to the communities with the intention of um, of us being able to hear from boards of civil authority around the state um, any feedback that they might have. Uh, given the delay in the census data from last year, um, we are uh, we lost about four and a half or five months of the time frame that we would have had to build this initial map, this initial bill, um, because the legislative apportionment board in a normal year would have uh, had their work done in August in order for us to begin our work. Uh, to be able to pass an initial map here at the beginning of the legislative session. And so um, to, uh, to account for that delay and, and to try to keep us on pace, but more importantly, to, to fast forward us to the point where we are hearing from communities on what, you know, what configuration of districts makes sense to them, uh, we are going to put out the, uh, the legislative apportionment board's alternate map um, and then that will give us the wealth of feedback that we have from the Legislative Apportionment Board's um, initial map, uh, their adopted map. And, uh, and if we put out this alternate one, then, uh, then that will be a, a good rich um, uh, set of feedback that we'll have from various communities from which we can begin to build districts uh, with the hope that we can um, pass our uh, final redistricting bill at the beginning of April. <clears throat> so, uh, don't have a heart attack. This is not uh, a map that is uh, is anything other than simply a starting point to get uh, information back from uh, from the communities around the state of Vermont, which is the job of the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. So, to that end, uh, we have with us uh, Legislative Council Amarin Abergele today, and we also have Nick Atherton, who's our mapping specialist. And um, so it's, I think it would be helpful for us to take a look at the bill. Um, the redistricting, um, while it is uh, tied very closely in our minds to a map and lines on a map uh, in order for the, that to be enacted into law, it has to come in the form of uh, actual statutory language. And so Amarin is gonna walk us through what that bill looks like um, that corresponds to the alternate map that we were looking at yesterday. And then we can take whatever questions we need to. So Amarin, would you, um, would you think it would be most helpful to go through the bill in its entirety and then do questions? Or would you like us to ask along the way? What, how do you think this makes the most sense? Uh, for the record, Amarin Abergele, Legislative Council. Uh, I, that was a, a question that I was struggling with a bit. It is uh, long and detailed. So why don't I just start doing the walkthrough? I, I'm not opposed to being interrupted. If people would like to ask questions as we go, that would be fine with me. Um, it is pretty high level. Uh, well, why don't I get started and we'll just see how it goes. I'm not sure the best way to do this, to be honest, um, just because well, I've never done this before, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not either. We'll figure it out. So committee members, let me know if you, uh, if you'd like to jump in with a question and right on cue, Rob LeClaire. I'm sorry. Um, whatever works best for Amory, but, uh, I have an excellent memory, but it's really short. So if I could ask a relevant question at that point, cause I could forget what it was going back six minutes ages later yeah i understand i think that probably makes the most sense um in my experience if one person has a question uh oftentimes it's enlightening for all of us so uh let's go ahead and raise hands along the way and and amarin will will just ask you to sort of pause in between pages or sections of the bill and and give folks a moment to get their hands up great 
So I am looking at, for everyone's reference, I'm looking at draft 1.1 of drafting request 22-0538, uh, dated 12-27-2021. This is, should be posted with today's materials. And because the bill itself does not have perhaps some of the detail that you're curious about from the alternate map, I've included some other materials here for you to use as additional references as you go over this bill over the next couple of days. One I thought might be helpful is the current house district summary. This just lists what the current districts are, uh, how many members there are per district and which towns are, or portions of towns are included within that. So this, while you're going through the draft, if you want to be able to quickly see, well, what's there now, you'll be able to do so. Um, in addition, I just wanted to mention that the, the LAB alternate map has uh, changed some of the district names based on which towns are within the districts. So you'll see some slight variation from what you are used to seeing. And also you'll see that within the bill draft there, it looks like there might be say a missing district. You'll see that it goes from Franklin one to Franklin three. This is so that when you're reviewing the draft, you can follow the draft and match it to the LAB alternate map. Um, so I chose not to renumber anything based on um, how the districts have changed. So it'd be as easily as possible to track um, what you're seeing in the bill with what you're seeing in the alternate map materials. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention, I've included the reference keys that you saw yesterday uh, when Nick was presenting. One of these is sorted by town. This is so that uh, one of the helpful items about the listing by town is that you can, if you follow along the list of towns, you'll be able to see which towns are being divided. Um, so that I thought was helpful information rather than going through the bill and trying to find which towns have been divided in the bill. You can go to this list and see if a town is listed twice, it will show you that it's been divided and where it, that division has gone. Um, and then for the reference key that's sorted by district, you'll be able to click on the map link within that and see what the actual district looks like. Because as you will see, as you're going through the bill, we don't have all of the, the customary detail, the meets and bounds that you're going to see in the final district uh, apportionment bill. Right now, what you just have is an identification of which towns are in a district. And you'll be able to see that some uh, some towns or cities will need to be further subdivided based on how many, how many members there are assigned to that large district. Um, and you will also see that there are going to be certain towns <clears throat> that have been specified as being divided to fit into two districts, though it does not say where that division line is. But if you wanted to go and look at the map in the um, reference key by district, you would be able to see where that line is. And that's where um, cities and towns would also be able to see the line that you are considering as an initial step, as a starting point for discussion. Thanks, Amron. And, and we'll be able to share all of this material out with the towns as they, uh, as they are being asked to give us feedback, right? So they'll, yes. they'll be able to see, oh, you know, this portion of our town is proposed to be in that district and the other portion of the town and yeah. Okay, that's super helpful. And you know, I, I think it's worth acknowledging just the, the the vast amount of time it takes to to actually describe with words where these boundaries go. <laughs> I mean, we we zoomed in yesterday on the Winooski district, and um, and you know, Winooski includes that small part of Burlington. Um, describing where those lines actually go in words. Um, is, uh, is definitely a time consuming process. And so I think uh, this is a, a, what we're gonna look at here is an attempt to sort of um, expedite that, but to still be very clear about what, you know, what we're asking folks to respond to. So Representative Gannon. Thank you. Um, Aaron, just a quick question about the house district map reference key sorted by district. Um, and this is specific to South Burlington. It references different districts. Are those basically wards? 
I believe so, but uh, Nick, I'm not sure if you know, this was compiled by uh, the LAB, not us. So I am not positive. Okay. I was just trying, I mean, it also references Burlington wards and Rutland wards. And I was just wondering if the South Burlington districts are, are wards. Go ahead, Nick. Thanks. Yes, I uh, put together this key and I was just using demographic information that was downloaded from the data set on in Mapitude that was used to create these, which referred to those uh, units as districts. Um, I'm not familiar with how South Burlington runs its municipal affairs, but I'm assuming that those are probably that's probably interchangeable with with boards if that's what they in fact what they use. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, folks? All right, Amarin, back to you. All right, so the good news is, while this is a 44 page document, we are not going to start on page one. Um, the, the bulk at the beginning is just me removing all of the current district language from statute. So everything from uh, page one down through to page, I want to say 20, around page 25, 26. Nope, nope. keep going, <laughs> keep going. It must've been when it went through editing. <laughs> okay. So I'm go. beginning now on page 35. I will wait just a moment to see everyone reaches that point. Okay. So first on page 35, you have the Addison districts. You'll see that the Addison districts listed here all either have a proposed two member or one member district. Um, you'll see that for Addison one and two um, and Addison dash Rutland down on lines 10 and 11, all of those are uh, districts that have complete towns with no divisions. You'll see that for Addison 3 and Addison 4, it's contemplated that a portion of Moncton will be uh, divided out between uh, Addison 3 and Addison 4. Then moving down to the Bennington districts, which start on line 13 on page 35 and move down on through page uh, 36. Line seven, <clears throat> you'll see that in Bennington one, it has Reedsboro, Stamford. Again, Powell is uh, separated out into Bennington uh, District 2 2 also. And you'll see that Bennington is divided between uh, Bennington 2 1 and 2 2. And then you'll see that Sunderland, when looking at Bennington three and four, has been divided between those two districts. Is this helpful if I just sort of do an overview and then just point out if some a particular town is divided and, okay. I'll keep going at this pace, but please let me know if you want me to not go into so much detail um, as you can look at it later or more detail. So then moving down to the Caledonia districts on page 36, You'll see that Caledonia's one, two, three, and then Caledonia Essex, Caledonia Washington um, are all districts that have uh, complete towns with no divisions. Representative Gannon has a question. Um, Cameron, and this is more to do when we report this on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, where it says a portion of the town, you know, not included in Bennington 2-2. Mm -hmm. What if somebody asks, well, what portion is that? Um, I, I think right now the answer from what I've heard from the chair and from what we've heard so far at the committee is that this committee has not made any formal decision about where that line is going to be. This is just an indication that the committee is seeking input from that town as to where that line should be and will include a map for that town as to what has been proposed by the LAB as to where that division is. Okay. Thank you. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Amarin. Um, I guess the question I've got at this point also is uh, the information that's being sent to the towns, 
uh, who actually sends that and what information is actually sent. Um, let's say there is a division in the towns. Are, are both maps going to be included? Uh, uh, is, it, is it specifically addressed to the BCAs? Um, you know, what, what, what are the answers to some of those questions? So I believe in the past, Legislative Council has served the function of notifying the boards of civil authorities in towns and cities. Um, and in terms of what materials you would like them to have, that is, is up to you. Um, what you believe would be important information for them to have when, um, as a basis for them to give you feedback. So we can send, I mean, we can send as much information and as uh, many uh, details as would be helpful. Okay, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, again, just thinking about it uh, from a small town perspective, well, maybe even a big town, but uh, the more specific information regarding uh, the potential for that district alone would be better than swamping them with a whole statewide map, you know? Um, anyway, just, just a thought. <clears throat> yeah, it occurs to me that um, in addition to having the bill language and the two other reference documents that we looked at, um, you know, by district and by town, it would also make sense to have, um, have a, a, a blow up of each district that we would uh, send to the district in, so that in the event that a, the part of the proposal was to divide one of the towns, uh, folks on the ground could see exactly where um, the LAB alternate map put that line um, and you know roughly how many people were included in uh, you know for for instance, you know how many, how many people in, uh, you know, in, in Pownall are proposed to go into Bennington one versus into Bennington two, two, that sort of thing. Um, that way they can, you know, the communities can try to triangulate from, uh, from what census data they have access to, you know, where they might propose putting the line um, in a different place. Uh, Representative Anthony. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, following along a, a suggestion I had yesterday to create a narrative, uh, as I think Representative Higley is suggesting, to uh, sort of focus. And the um, other uh, contribution, if you will, uh, since we're going to be holding regional uh, feedback meetings, it might be useful to anticipate what the geography of that region is and focus on that region uh, during the send out so that in essence, somebody in the Northeast is not getting a whole bottom, uh, uh, bit of narrative and material for the Southeastern part of the state, because frankly, it would be uh, overkill and irrelevant to that forum. Yeah, that makes sense because uh, as we have learned, you know, making a change in one place has that ripple effect of, um, of forcing changes in neighboring districts. So, <clears throat> uh, Representative LeClaire. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Chair, sorry, just thinking ahead here. Um, I, I don't know if this question is going to be answered with later or not, but as far as the feedback to the communities, let's say that we're working on Madam Chair's area over there, will the communities be given the feedback like in real time? Um, or are we going to be setting things up where they'll have, be able to access it online? And how often will they be able to be allowed feedback on the plans as they evolve? Do we know that? So are you, you're asking about after we've moved this bill out, after we've had our regional hearings, and then we begin to adjust and, and work in on the final maps? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, we are going to need to to put up, you know, draft maps as we continue to work on um, on different regions of the state. We'll we'll have to put them up with our committee documents the way we always do. Um, I don't I don't think in the past that there has been any sort of continuous uh, in you know like specific email to the town of. Bradford or, or, you know, anything else. Um, I think we sort of rely on folks to, to follow the process if they're, 
interested and, you know, unlike 10 years ago or any other time we've ever done redistricting, anyone who wants to can be in this committee room with us watching every step of the way. And, um, and so that's actually kind of cool. And I wonder if it's going to mean that we get more feedback or if it'll mean that, um, that people are just, you know, sort of com comfortable with the process and, um, and, and we'll just give targeted feedback. I, I don't know what to predict. This could be okay. like a, this could be like a great tsunami. That, that makes some sense. So, so the expectation is, say, if you're dealing with, say, Bennington and you're moving around a, a population block, that we're not going to be looking for feedback from that community on, the, on a daily basis as to how they think that it should be. We'll make that information available online and then they're going to have to have some initiative to pop on and see what's happened. Yeah. Okay. And, and I'm sure that you know, that the representatives, the current representatives of any given area of the state will also, um, you know, will also be Involved. in tune with what's going on and, and hopefully be, be able to be that liaison okay. between Thank the you. and the House Government Operations Committee. That's why we have a big room for when we get back into the State House. Uh, Representative Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with representatives uh, Anthony and Kigley that it's going to be really important to, to get a narrative and, 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 and that type of information out ahead. Um, but what might the process be as this will probably raise questions for, for having those questions answered? Is there uh, any thought to that? Um. I don't know. Um, anyone want to jump in with a thought on that? Go ahead, Representative Anthony. Yeah, I'll give it a go. I, I do think there ought to be a specified window. I agree with Representative LeClaire that people, we will have to depend on people's initiative uh, of, of being attentive, if you will, as a particular area of the state evolves, but then uh, there ought to be a sort of window of saying, we will take written comments up until the time we have our hearings. And then uh, it's our obligation essentially to answer the issues that are raised at the hearing point, then the door closes. I, I think it has to be that way. Uh, otherwise we'll never get it out by the beginning of April, April the final proposal. I would suspect that um, <clears throat> that if we talk with folks who've done this in previous years, we'll find that um, that it's not quite as hard and fast as you know. This is your window, but uh, but there will be an official time, uh, you know, that that we want to hear from BCAs um, in this initial round. Uh, Representative Higley and and acknowledging that Rep Higley is uh, the one of us who's done this process before. Maybe you've got some thoughts on this. Well, again, I was looking back at my, I did have a folder that I saved, believe it or not. And it's pretty thick with uh, letters that did come back from, from different towns uh, throughout the process. I can tell you also though, at, very, at the very end of the process, there were actual calls made to towns. Um, initially, uh, set up in a sense through legislators talking with uh, town officials. Uh, I'll give you an example. It was actually in my district. One of the finalized districts was, okay, Troy, uh, the potential is um, you're going to go completely over with Newport um, or you can carve out a chunk of Troy or we can carve out a chunk of Troy uh, that will go with Newport um, and, and those are the two options. What do you, uh, wh what would you like to do? And basically they said, hey, we don't want to go with Newport. Uh, we'd be, you know, completely, uh, they felt, you know, out of, out of whack in the sense of the, the size of the towns. So they uh, made it a conscious decision to um, look at a map that we created to chunk out 400 people out of Troy and put it with Newport. So, you know, that's, that's part of our process at the very end, believe it or not, that when it came down to some last minute changes that we had to make to get things completely done, 
we uh, we actually reached out uh, uh, by phone at times to to these town officials. Again, being set up though in advance by you know the reps having a meeting um, with them, uh, talking them uh, talking to them about the alternatives. All right, ready to jump back in. I think we are on page 35, 36, 30. Yes, I believe I left off on 36 um, with just starting uh, Chittenden districts. You'll see uh, Chittenden one is all of Richmond. Chittenden two has a portion of Williston. The other portion of Williston is in Chittenden seven. Uh, Jericho and Underhill are within one district. You'll see that uh, Charlotte and a portion of Heinsburg are included in Chittenden 4-1, and then the other portion of Heinsburg is in 4-2. You'll see Chittenden 5 um, is St. George and Shelburne, but it is listed with three members, noting that there needs to be a division of some sort within um, this Chittenden 5 to make it a Chittenden 5-1 and Chittenden 5-2. You'll see Chittenden 6 is uh, proposed to be all of Burlington and Winooski, which would be a total of 12 members. So that is one of the subdivisions that this committee will need to make um, with input from boards of civil authority. <clears throat> and then similarly for Chittenden 7, this is uh, South Burlington and that portion of Williston that wasn't in Chittenden 2 for a total of five members. Again, this will need to be uh, broken down into one and two member districts. And then Chittenden 8, uh, it looks like we have a spacing issue here, but that will have five members. So once again, this would need to break down Essex, or excuse me, this would have Essex, Westford, uh, the, a portion of Colchester that's not in Chittenden 9, and then a portion of the town of Milton not included in Chittenden 9 or 10. <clears throat> so Chittenden 9, again, is that portion of Colchester and then a portion of Milton. You'll see Chittenden 10. Um, this is one of the only Chittenden districts that currently just has the two members and in theory would not need to be broken down further. This is a portion of Georgia, not included in Franklin one, and a portion of the town of Milton, not included in Chittenden eight or Chittenden nine. I will note that Milton um, in the LAB alternate map is divided into three different districts. Um, so I wanted to make a note of that for the committee. Moving down uh, Essex, Caledonia um, contains all whole towns. Essex, Caledonia, and Orleans also has uh, whole towns or gores also in this instance. And then we move into the Franklin districts. Uh, you'll see, as I noted previously in my intro, there is no Franklin two listed here. That is because what was Franklin two, the two towns that were previously Franklin two, or maybe it was one town, has since been divided and moved into different districts, meaning that there is no Franklin two um, contemplated at the moment, <clears throat> at least in the formulation that you're used to looking at. So this has, uh, I would say for all of the Franklin districts, you'll see there is a division of at least one town, um, but these all, uh, and I will note that St. Albans City and a portion of St. Albans Town are within Franklin three. This would need to be subdivided into a either three one member districts or at least one two member district and one one member district. Moving down to page 39, the Grand Isle. Um, Grand Isle, South Hero and a portion of North Hero. And then Grand Isle Franklin has the other portion of North Hero as well as a portion of Swanton that is not included in Franklin four. For the Lamoille districts, you see that uh, Stowe is proposed to be divided between Lamoille 1 and Lamoille, Washington. Uh, however, Lamoille 2 and 3 have uh, whole towns within them. And the other, uh, oh yes, and then you see the portion of Stowe is in Lamoille, Washington. 
Moving into the orange districts for orange one, two, one and two, um, you have whole towns within those districts, also whole towns within Orange Caledonia and Orange Washington. I'm now on page 40. Moving into the Orleans counties, uh, Orleans one and two consist of whole towns. Orleans two, which is a uh, Orleans two, one and two, two are two one member districts, but you'll see uh, that Newport is divided between these two districts and Orleans 2-1 has a portion of Troy that is not included uh, down in Orleans Lamoille district. And then Orleans 3 is, consists of whole towns. Moving down into Rutland, Rutland Bennington um, has a division of Wells and then additional whole towns. Rutland one has the uh, other portion of Wells as well as Ira and Poultney. Rutland two has whole towns plus a portion of Mount Holly, which is other the remainder of Mount Holly would be in Rutland Windsor two. Rutland three, uh, one and three two is whole towns, Castleton, Benson, Fairhaven and West Haven. Rutland four is a portion of Rutland town that's not included in Rutland five and a portion of Menden that's not included in Rutland Windsor one. This is a one member district. So for Rutland five, you'll see this is all of Rutland city as well as that small portion of Rutland town not included in Rutland four. So this presently is listed as a four member district and will need to be subdivided. Rutland six and Rutland seven are uh, districts with whole towns, Rutland, Windsor, Bridgewater, Killington, Stockbridge, and then that town of Menden that was not included in Rutland 4. And I will note again that if you are looking at just how much of a portion is proposed of being moved out, you can look at that house reference key where it lists by town and it will show you the breakdown of how many individuals from each town are proposed to be in one district and another. So in some instances, it looks like maybe this is a town being divided, but if you look at the house key, you'll see that perhaps the proposal is just to carve out um, a few census blocks in order to bring up the deviation or bring down the deviation in a particular district. So uh, Rutland, Windsor two, Ludlow, here's the other portion of Mount Holly that wasn't included in Rutland two, and Shrewsbury. And that concludes the Rutland related districts. Now moving into Washington districts, you have uh, whole towns or cities for all of the Washington districts. Moving down into page 42 now. Um, and that goes all the way down through Washington Chittenden as well as Washington Orange. And then looking at the Wyndham counties, you'll see Wyndham one is whole towns. Wyndham two is Brattleboro, but that is listed as a district with three members and will need to be subdivided. Wyndham three and four have whole towns. Wyndham five um, only has a portion of Marlboro and the <laughs> other portion of Marlboro is in Wyndham six. Moving on to page 43. Um, Wyndham Bennington County and Winnington, Wyndham Bennington Windsor counties are whole towns. Windsor one um, only has a portion of Windsor that's not included in the Windsor Wyndham County. Windsor two and three are whole towns. Uh, Windsor Wyndham, uh, Athens Grafton, and again that portion of Windsor not included in Windsor one. Um, the remaining Windsor County, Windsor related counties on this page all have whole towns. That's Windsor four, Windsor five, Windsor Orange one, Windsor Orange two, and then Windsor Addison Rutland moving on to page 44. So that completes the list of towns for all of these districts, then uh, which that comprises section one of this bill. Section two of this bill, as you uh, may recall from our review of the statutory provisions, there is 
uh, both contemplated a two bill process, this being the first bill, and then a window of time where um, cities and towns are provided the opportunity to propose how they would like to subdivide those three or more member uh, districts from this bill. So we were looking at Bennington, um, Burlington, South Burlington, Rutland City, um, those that will need to be subdivided in order to meet the constitu constitutional requirements of one or two member districts. Um, the boards of civil authority by statute typically have until April 1st to provide that feedback to you. However, you have uh, not had the opportunity of having months of receiving feedback about any of these districts um, and not being able to have looked at the census data <clears throat> on time this year. So uh, I lost my train of thought. So the, um, so currently the, uh, by statute, the date is April 1st. However, if you are looking to uh, complete uh, your work in advance of that date or looking to have a, a final version of the districts before April 1st, then that deadline in statute would need to be moved. So section two would uh, require that if boards of civil authority want to propose a division of initial districts, they need to submit those proposals to the clerk on before January 21st, 2022. I will note that we, we went back and um, spoke with the house clerk and looked through um, the house clerk files and we were not able to find that a formal proposal for subdivision um, was made in the last two reapportionment cycles um, but we do have records of the of this committee reaching out to all of the uh, boards of civil authority and boards and towns to request specific feedback. So it sounds like rather than going through the formal proposal of subdivision to the house clerk, um, cities and towns have instead primarily worked through this committee um, as to see how those subdivisions should go. So, and then lastly, the effective date of this bill would be upon passage. Excellent, uh, Rep. Leclerc has a question. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, Amrin, if we just jump back up to say Wyndham, I think that's on page 43. Yes. Is there a written description for the part of Windsor that's not included in Windsor one? Or is that just based on the existing map that we're using now and how that played out mathematically? Do you... <clears throat> if there is a, a couple thoughts on that. Um, I do not have a written description of where the line is. We have a map from the LAB alter alternate map as to where that, that line right. would be. And right. I do not, I'm, I'm hopeful that some of the description of these proposed changes will be in the reports that this committee is receiving from the Legislative Apportionment Board. That's so it may be that your ask. answer is addressed in there. Okay. I do not have a description at this moment. So currently we don't have one, but there's an expectation that there will be something coming along, adding some clarity. I oh, believe there is... Typically not a meets and bounds, but there is at least an explanation as to the purpose of why the division is being made. Perfect. Thank you. And we have all morning tomorrow with the chair of the Legislative Apportionment Board. And um, so Tom Little will, um, if he doesn't have uh, both of the narratives completed, um, he will he will have quite a bit of those narratives done. I think they were really uh, scrambling to get them done. And, um, and the Legislative Apportionment Board will provide narratives for both their adopted map and the alternate map um, from which people can understand, you know, what, how many people from one community and, and, you know, the line follows, you, you know, the Saxton's River or whatever. Um, and that descriptor, I think, will be very valuable to the communities as they give us feedback. Uh, Representative Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, Amarant used the phrase by April 1st and then said we had to change, um, amend that. I, I thought if the language actually says by, we would be able to set a de date for our expected receipt of items before April 1st, or am I missing something? I think the way to do the way to accomplish that, as far as I understand, is to notwithstand the April 1st and say that instead by January 21st. Is that is that accurate, Amrin? Yes. <clears throat> yes. So just for to be really explicit about it and and not leave it floating, so to say. Yeah. Representative Higley. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a, a question that, uh, and maybe we'll have the Secretary of State's office in as well, but uh, I'm assuming there's possibly some legislation that we can pass that might give us a little more time as far as uh, uh, what the Secretary of State is, is considering. Um, again, uh, looking at maybe, uh, you know, how two years ago uh, we didn't require uh, signatures for for folks that were going to run. Um, I just uh, um, and maybe maybe we can reach out to the Secretary of State's office in advance to see what some of those things might be. But uh, if we're really in a time crunch here, there might be a few things like that that we can put into place that would uh, that would help. Yeah, um, I understand what you're getting at. Um, the conversations that I've um, had with the Secretary of State's office so far are really um, uh, really urging us to to aim for that beginning of April to do the final passage of this plan. Um, and and the reason for that is really just working backwards from the date of the primary um, because uh, obviously you know you, you've got the primary, the voting window for the primary starts 45 days ahead of that ballots need to be mailed <clears throat> 45 days ahead of that and and that is to comply with the requirements of being able to get ballots to folks serving in the military overseas right that's that's the 45 day window that allows time for a ballot to get to some military base um, and back <clears throat> so that we're not dis disenfranchising folks who are serving in the military and then from from the 45 days when the ballots need to be mailed, obviously the ballots have to be formulated and printed and um, candidates need to know what district they live in so that they know what district they're filing to run in. Um, and so that's what gets us back to the beginning of April. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it, it is what it is. And I will certainly um, check in with the Secretary of State's office and see if they can come and, and help us understand their thinking on that. Other questions? All right, so folks, do we want to do we want to look together at um, uh, at either of the other documents? I mean, they are pretty self-explanatory, but um, but I don't want to I don't want to assume that folks are comfortable with how to read them unless we've done a little bit of work on them. All right, um, so committee, um, let's open this up for a little bit of committee discussion. I think that, um, well, actually, before we do committee discussion, um, I think, uh, Nick, you have a couple other documents up here for today. So if you could, um, if you could just orient us to the documents that, that you've created and posted for today. Certainly, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to. Um... I'm gonna share my screen with your permission. Okay. Okay, great. So let's start with um, the 2010 boundaries. This is the first map that we were discussing. Can everyone see this by the way? 
Um, hang on just a moment. I think we need Andrea as the host to make you, oh, um, gotcha. of course, make you co-host. Unfortunately, I'm co-host, which puts me second on the totem pole and I can't give you screen share. All right. Yes, we can see your map now. Okay, excellent. So um, this map is a just a, a new version of the same one we were looking at yesterday. So same data, just a different uh, visualization. This has uh, the 2010 Vermont House districts with our new population totals from the 2020 census. Um, and uh, this, these uh, insets for the urban areas are available in the following pages. So it's a three-page document, full-page map on the front one, and then the following two pages are uh, inset details of various urban areas. Um, let's see. So this and the next map that we're about to get to are both available on the committee webpage for uh, download as PDFs. Um, the second one that I prepared is the LAB alternative redistricting plan. The one, this is the map that we, this is a visualization of essentially the bill that we've just been discussing that Amarin has been leading us through. So as we've been talking about uh, where the meets and bounds are or, or are not, um, actually written out, this can help provide some uh, visual uh, reference for where those lines might fall and will eventually be described. Although, just to be clear, this is, of course, the LAB's proposal and not um, anything binding. So uh, these, uh, yeah, so these should help folks uh, orient themselves um, as to where some of the, what these boundaries uh, as proposed look like. Any questions? Representative Gannon. Um, thank you, Mad Madam Chair. Um, I was taking a quick look at my own district um, or the new Wyndham Six, which, you know, hopefully I'll get reelected, but you never know. Um, uh, it has part of Reedsboro in it, and I don't believe that's consistent um, with the alternative proposal in the legislation um, or um, what we heard testimony on yesterday from um, Jeannie Albert. I believe Wyndham, the new Wyndham 6 district includes Wilmington, Whitingham, Halifax, and part of Marlboro, and not part of Reedsboro. I see that too. Um, yeah, that's somewhat odd. Um, this is, again, this is the map that I was, uh, map using the data I was provided with uh, directly from LABs. Um, so there may be some, some discrepancy in what that, uh, what, how that was drafted. Maybe I got an older draft or something like that, um, but that can be addressed. Okay, I, I mean, given how confusing this is, I, I mean, having accurate maps, I think it's really important, especially as other members outside of our committee start to take a look at this. Certainly. Um, because people will freak out. Yeah, especially if there's somebody who represents the neighboring district who sees that they're that, the, that they're being moved into your district. <laughs> um, Representative Lefebvre. Thank you. This was the map that I was looking at all day yesterday. Um, so I know it's not, I don't know if it's the one that was the original thought for 2010 and then we just put the 2020 numbers like, like over it um the alternative but this was the one that i got confused with yesterday so i know it's right. not the one that we actually are being but wherever that map is it keeps coming up because i had it all day yesterday yeah it you're i think you're right rep lefave i think that this is one of the earlier versions of the lab alternative map um, because the one of the earlier versions had um, Williamstown and Orange in a district, and I see that that's what you're looking at here. Um, the final version that Jeannie Albert went over with us yesterday had um, had Orange in the district with Barry Town. I think is that correct? Yeah. So yeah, we may need to uh, we may need to just double check that um that we're getting the right version of that map up um representative anthony 
Yeah, just I think you've already said it. I want to emphasize that Miss Albert should be the person who signs off and says, OK, this is the most up to date version of the alternate map, period. Get rid of the rest because okay. it's just confusing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Any other questions or um, Nick, anything else you want to orient us to for documents? that you brought uh, today. No, nothing. I apologize for any any error. I'll look into that after this uh, committee meeting and make sure that that, is, that gets addressed. Um, but other than that, I don't think there's anything that I need to present. Is there, are there any other questions that, that I can help answer? Uh, Amron. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was going to say, if with the committee's permission, it would be great if Nick and I could work with um, Jeannie Albert if she's available over the next day, just to confirm that. So I, I had a similar issue with the with the bill draft that I had to redo some of it last night because I found that I had had an old version somewhere mixed in with one district and then had to reshuffle a bunch. Um, and certainly, we want to make sure that both the bill draft descriptions of, of towns and districts, as well as the map are as accurate as possible. And with the committee's permission, um, I'd love to for Nick and I to be able to work with her and make sure that this is the way it should be. Absolutely. Um, please thank and thank you, because I, I think if, um, if we intend to give the communities, um, you know, the most helpful information for them to respond to, we're going to want to also create regional insets uh, you know, blow ups of um, of a particular district with its surrounding districts so that uh, communities know how to um, make helpful feedback. Representative Anthony. Maybe it's self-evident, but I'd like to say it when we do uh, craft the regional narratives. And, and, and I think that's a great uh, idea not to compliment myself. But anyway, if we conceive of where we're going to call a region a region for public input purposes, I think it's incumbent on us to shine a particular flashlight on any of the um, districts that now have to be subdivided. Uh, we know, uh, and there's several around, uh, Bennington, uh, um, uh, Chittenden County, Burlington, uh, and, and have a particular paragraph narrative saying, this is really important. We really want you to focus on the fact that we have eight representatives in Burlington and we can't do that. We have to know what you want in terms of numbers of twos and ones. Uh, that's what the constitution demands and, and sort of press them to be very explicit where we know it's gonna, five is gonna have to be divided into two twos and a one or three ones and a two, thanks. Yeah, um, I, I believe that we will all find valuable the narrative that the Legislative Apportionment Board is creating. Um, let's go off screen share um, so we can come back to committee. There we go. Now I can see all of you. Um, uh, Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I just wanted to share with folks the, uh, the file that I actually found um, and these are, these are some of the letters. Uh, this is from the town of Lincoln, uh, very one page. Uh, this is from Colchester, it's like five pages. It even has an actual map where they created, uh, you know, some of the lines. Um, I, again, though, a lot of towns in their comments basically just said, you know, we like the district we're currently in, we want to stay that way. And, and of course, you know, that, that in a lot of cases wasn't, uh, wasn't um, uh, reasonable or, or wouldn't, wouldn't happen in the end. The other thing is, and, and this is where uh, Nick's really going to come into play is, uh, this is just an example of one of the maps. This is H&H, &H. I don't know if this was Higley and Hubert or wherever, but, you know, we took an area came up with, with uh, a, a new mapping um, and would come back to the committee and go over it. And, uh, and you know, this is, it, it's just, it's just amazing the amount of maps that were created, but 
I uh, just thought I'd share that. The other, the other thing I guess I'm, I'm thinking about <coughs> um, in regards to getting some information out there, um, do you think it would be a good idea to uh, create an email for um, all house members in regards to, <coughs> excuse me, um, sending out maybe the um, alternative map, uh, the house uh, reference key map for sorted by districts and sorted by town um, would help uh, give people a little bit of a heads up to, to look at, uh, I mean, I've been trying to do that on my own, but I'm just wondering if it might um, alleviate some of the questions and fears if and when it does come to the floor. Right. So you're suggesting that that we should really highlight this uh, this resource for folks right now, so that they can um, so that they can just know in more fine grained detail what exactly we're talking about. Right. And actually, I've done that with some actually sending them the the uh, in particular uh, again the the uh, alternative map sorted by district and then sorted by town, so that they can actually you know, take a look themselves at, oh, wow, you know, um, this is, this is what it means. This is where uh, the divisions are right now. And uh, um, anyway, I just, uh, I just think it might be helpful to, to get that information out there and, and let them, let them consume it at their, at their own rate and, and possibly answer some questions in advance of a big floor um, debate. Right, right. Um, I think to that point, uh, Rep Higley, and, and it's a very good one that there's going to be a, a high degree of anxiety on the part of um, <laughs> on the part of uh, sitting members, you know, like what what does this all mean for my district? Um, but I think uh, for the purposes of what's on our committee page, we need to make sure that we either relabel the the incorrect maps as you know as earlier versions, or um, or in some way cordon off so that if somebody's just simply going to our documents page, they uh, they have a set of documents and uh, reference keys that that we are absolutely certain correspond to the the bill that we're going to try to move. So um, maybe. Uh, Maybe Amarin and Nick and Andrea can uh, can double check that and make sure that we have, um, you know, a, a a set of information that people can access uh, because we don't want them to have the experience that Rep Lefave did yesterday in looking at a map that does two completely different things to uh, you know to her district, and then you know I guess I would also just say again to us in this committee and ask you to share with your uh, with your colleagues um, um, on the floor that this is uh, this is simply a starting point from which we will get feedback there's nothing uh, about this uh, this initial starting point that that is um, in any way uh, an indication of what the final map might look like um, it's simply a tool to get us to the point where we're able to get feedback from the boards of civil authority and, uh, and to do that in a timely manner. <clears throat> and Mark, I really appreciate you sharing um, all of the, the various kinds of uh, feedback and, and resources. It's, it's really valuable that we have access to sort of see how that was done 10 years ago, because um, you know, some communities will submit a map, other communities will do a paragraph, as uh, I think you showed Lincoln was really short and Colchester had a lot to say. So, um, you know, that's, that's where I'm, that's where this starts, this process starts to get really real when we, <clears throat> when we get into the point of getting feedback from communities. Uh, Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I'm not looking to make a complicated process more complicated. But um, I have heard a couple comments made that somehow that this alternative map was going to be the one that would be the basis for our conversations <laughs> going forward. And I do want to point out that this was not the map that was passed by the LAB board. Right. And the other one, um, I believe, deserves as much 
due diligence and deferences we've given this one at least sometime along this process, obviously sooner than later. I appreciate that perspective and um, we will we will take a deeper dive into that again, um, although we have once with, uh, with Tom Little in December. Um, any other questions with respect to the map and reference keys that we've been looking at so far this morning? All right. Um, <clears throat> so I have invited Deputy Secretary of State Chris Winters to come and join us because um, we've, uh, we've had a few questions in committee and um, Chris, welcome and, and thank you for being here. Uh, just to orient you, um, <clears throat> everybody's feeling a little bit stressed about the prospect of trying to get this project done um, by the beginning of April. And, um, and in fact, um, you know, maybe, maybe Rep Higley, if you want to repeat your question, because I, I don't want to do a poor job of, of repeating it. But, um, but Chris is here and available to have a chat with us. So Rep Higley, why don't you go ahead and, um, and ask your question? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, uh, because of the crunch and, and having uh, 10 years ago uh, gotten so much further along, um, I am concerned about uh, making sure we do our due diligence uh, in responding to towns and, and uh, uh, doing the work we need to do. Um, and just uh, would ask the Secretary of State's line line, maybe for a um, a written out timeline. It's always, it's hard for me to keep it straight in my head. You went through it. I appreciate that. Uh, again, with the timeline for printing ballots and mailing out ballots and so on and so forth. But again, if there's anything we can do uh, legislatively in advance to um, give us a little more time or help out uh, <clears throat> individuals that are, that are considering a run um, uh, I'd, I'd appreciate knowing that um, as to what we can do. And again, I mentioned um, uh, regarding not having to, uh, you know, collect uh, uh, names on a petition, not having to file a petition uh, when running again, uh, whether or not that would uh, save a little bit of time if, if we're not even sure quite when uh, we're going to know what district we're, we're going to be in. That's, that's about it, I guess. Thank you, Rep Higley, for the question, and thank you, Madam Chair, for inviting me to, to testify today. Good to see everyone. Um, so if you if you go to the August primary and work backward from there, uh, some of the timeline comes into focus, and we'd be happy to put this in writing for the committee to, to help clarify things. I think that would be helpful. Um, but looking at an early August primary backing up the 45 days that we are uh, required to send ballots out to overseas and, and military voters and, and make early voting available. That puts you uh, somewhere at the end of June. And, I, and again, I can put precise dates to these on paper, but if you're looking at, you're looking at the end of June to get those ballots in the hands of town clerks and sent overseas in some instances. Um, so backing up from there, we in the Secretary of State's office have to, have to create and provide, uh, it's a big number, like 275 different ballot styles so that you have the right candidates for each district in the state. And of course you can't do that until you know what the districts look like. So uh, backing up from the end of June, the, um, we, need, we need a good amount of time to prepare those ballots. The candidate nominating petitions are by statute due, um, and don't quote me on these dates exactly, but I think it's between April 25th and May 26th is when candidates can file. Uh, so giving, you know, using that end date of about May 26th, that gives us about a month to prepare those ballots and know who has filed to run and to get all those 275 ballot styles correct and in the hands of town clerks printed and in the hands of town clerks. So that, that's the 30 day window that, that we like to have for that. The candidate filing, they have about that 30 days as well that backs you up to April uh, 25th for when that starts. So that's why we've been saying 
early April uh, for the legislature to have its work done, for candidates to know what their districts are going to look like. It's not as much of a problem for statewide candidates, but uh, county and uh, town and local, um, it's good to know. They would need to know before April 25th when that candidate filing window begins. Now, we have talked a little bit about perhaps you could narrow the candidate filing window. We wouldn't want to do that too much. It's a 30-day window right now. Perhaps there's wiggle room for a week or two in there. Um, that's something that's been floated. Um, we haven't you know, thoroughly thought that through, but there's a, a spot where maybe you could gain a little bit of time. Um, but hopefully that answers your question as to why we're looking at early April, backing up from an early August primary. <clears throat> And the, the timelines are really tight, obviously not ideal. The, the census being late through this all out of whack and we're all doing this in, in as quick a manner as we can without um, giving short <laughs> to the thoroughness that we need to do uh, to, to make sure we get this done right. I appreciate that, Chris. And, and I did hear about, you know, the possibility of that two week window from, you know, April 25th to May 26th now. And, um, you know, it might be, it might be a consideration again. Uh, I'm not sure how that would affect a lot of folks, uh, cutting that down from that 30 days, but, uh, it, it could help us out. Representative LeClaire. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, Mr. Deputy Secretary of State. Nice haircut since good I morning. saw you last time. <laughs> thank you. Um, is it my understanding, Chris, that a fair amount of what we're having to contend with here is is basically federal statute as far as primary dates and, you know, the 45 days, is, is that primarily federal? For the overseas and military voters, yes. Okay. Um, do you know if anything's being done at the federal level to have some conversations around this? Because... I can't imagine Vermont that we're the only ones that are feeling a lot of pressure to get this done. And this is a very heavy lift. And I can't believe that everybody would be so naive to think that things are going to happen so quickly and so precisely that we're going to hit every target date. It's, it's a good question, Representative LeClaire. I haven't looked into it, but I will. I don't know exactly what the, you know, the primary dates are in, in other states and whether Vermont is maybe on the early end of that, um, but there may be some that are earlier. I can, I can take a look into that for you and report yeah. back to you. You know, just one other quick comment here in that, you know, yes, we're working towards the April 1st date. I understand the importance of that, but it would be helpful, I think, if we had some recommendations from you folks as to some things that we could tweak a little bit to even buy an extra few days if need be. Because um, I don't know what to say if we get to that, you know, if we're close to the end of uh, March and we still have a lot left to do, what do we do? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Well, clearly we just stopped taking lunch breaks and we <laughs> work harder. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel that way too, Representative Anthony. Uh, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Following on on uh, Representative LeClaire, it seems to me that the federal is a window for primaries. And as we all know, if you're running as an independent, you don't have to worry about that. I'm just wondering if the primary, the, the selected date for Vermont can be moved to the end or outer uh, edge of the um, window uh, thus giving, instead of waving at the front end, the signature or any of those process, move the primary uh, back as far as it can be, uh, unless there's some sort of congressional dispensation that we don't know about yet. Uh, so that, in essence, we don't have to front load the spring so much as we're, we're running up against or buying some more time in the summer for uh, preparation for primary and balloting and return of military ballots. It seems to me either end, you, you could gain some weeks either way. Thanks. Yeah, th thanks, Representative Anthony. I think uh, I heard the term used earlier, the domino effect. If you move the primary, uh, that's going to affect the general. One of the reasons that we moved the, that the legislature moved the primary back in the first place was ballot creation. And again, meeting that 45 day window for the general election. Uh, we didn't have enough time to do that. We were sued by the DOJ. Um, so 
there are ripple effects there as well if you try to move the date of the primary itself in affecting ballot creation and getting ready for the general election in November. Secretary Condos, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. And I really appreciate your flexibility in popping in at the, at the very moment that we're covering these topics. Um, <clears throat> we are, uh, we are, are covering at this moment um, all of the legislative language necessary to move out an initial <clears throat> uh, draft map for the purpose of trying to expedite feedback from the communities about how to draw a final map. And we've uh, we've been exploring some of the concerns about this tight timeline that we are on because of the census delay. And um, so these, these conversations are really around, can we sneak any time out from the, the end of uh, this process in order to buy us more time here with the maps? Um, so welcome, I'll, I'll let you say any remarks you want to, although your deputy secretary has covered it very well. Uh, thank you um, and, and welcome back committee. Uh, uh, we're in, it's an interesting time for us all. I think we, um, you know, I think when, when this thing first started in March of 2020, when the governor locked down the state and went into an emergency order, uh, I don't think any of us thought it was going to be more than four, six, or eight weeks that we were going to be in this pandemic, and here we are almost two years later. Um, as far as what's going on with, with the um, redistricting and the time deadlines, everything hinges on November 8th. That's the general election, and you have to back up for each phase of it going backwards. And for instance, so you have general election is November 8th. Early voting and overseas and military voting starts September 26th. The overseas and military September 26th can't be changed because that's a federal issue. Uh, so that can't be changed. So ballots have to be in the hands of the clerks on or before September 26th. Uh, the last day for party nominations is August 19th after the primary. Uh, the statewide canvas is on August 16th. The primary, of course, is August 9th. The last day for independent and minor party is August 4th. And then we start to back up again. Early voting and overseas and military is June 25th. Uh, the last day for filing of by major party candidates um, is May 26th. And the first day to file as candidate petitions is April 25th. So, in reality, the only place you could really pick up any time would be perhaps to shorten the window for filing of candidate petitions from four weeks to say two weeks. Um, so instead of April 25th, it would be sometime the first week or so of, of May, that would give at least two weeks to major party candidates to file their, their uh, petitions uh, for the May 26th. A lot of this also hinges, you know, you, you, you look at, oh, May, May 26th to June 25th, there's a lot of time there. Well, that's four weeks. And keep in mind that our elections team, uh, which is the smallest in the state, in the, in the country, uh, has those four weeks to create, design, create, proof, send to the printers, get back the proofs from the printers, uh, making sure everything is correct with the right districts and all that and the right names, the right spellings, everything else. So we have a very short window of four weeks to do two, right now it's 275 different uh, ballot designs. And if you go to single member districts, um, that would increase the 275, we we don't even know what it would be at this point, but it would probably be somewhere north of 300 uh, independent, uh, uh, distinct ballots that have to be designed and then shipped to the print uh, to the town clerks. So we 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 have a four week window to get all that work done to get those ballots, the right ballot, into the right clerk's hands to make sure that they they are ready to go. Um, 
So you really don't have a lot of time. Uh, and, and like I said, the only place you could really gain would be to shorten the window for filing of candidate petitions, but that's only going to gain you two weeks. Um, we haven't even discussed if, if you go to single member districts, and I'm not advocating one way or the other, but if you go to single member districts, there's also additional cost placed on our office on the election system because there's an increase in number of ballots that have to be printed, number of districts that have to be printed, all that uh, that has to be done. So, um, uh, so I, you know, I, I guess I, I, I know that Chris has talked to you, you know, in 2012, Vermont was sued by the Department of Justice uh, for ballots being sent out late. Um, and, and let me describe what late was. Uh, just so you understand where the Department of Justice takes this. Uh, the 40, 45th day is, is Saturday. We sent out 150 out of 800 ballots on Monday, the following Monday, two days later, um, by email. And <laughs> the Department of Justice said they didn't care, that was late, and they sued us in, in federal court over that um and and uh representative gannon i think you you'll appreciate this but uh, uh most most first first year lawyers understand that uh uh if a if, if a deadline day falls on a holiday or weekend it's the next business day and that was the approach that vermont had always taken well the department of justice in the area of voting says no we go with the day before so that's why you back up to the 46th day, even though the statute only says the 45th day. So anyway, that's that's the situation. Uh, nothing, um, you know. Once the the suit was filed, uh, we fi we settled on a consent decree with the, with the Department of Justice within seven days, uh, and we moved forward. But uh, that was when we moved the, the primary from the fourth Tuesday of August to the second Tuesday of August. Um, so anyway, that's that's where we are. And I know that Chris has explained some of this. I didn't get the message. Uh, uh, I didn't see the email until just before I signed on. But uh, uh, that's where that's where you are. The, the other piece I want to add to this, because I, I, I've heard some folks not here. I haven't heard it here, but I've heard some folks say, well, maybe we could just waive petition signatures and we're the issue with that was the ones that were raised last year uh when we when we asked this was well we're going to get a whole lot of people that are going to file and truth be told we had 20 candidates uh for president of the united states that takes up space on the on the ballot and uh uh if we i'm, I'm not against having more people on the ballot but what i'm saying is if in a year when you're going to have a lot of open seats uh whether it be legislative or statewide or federal um there's a potential for an awful lot of folks to file and if they don't have to have petitions of some sort then it becomes uh an increasing number so anyway that's where i am Thank you, Secretary Condos. I appreciate that. And, uh, and I think it's, it's worth acknowledging that um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we, we didn't know as much about the modes of transmission of COVID as we do now. And so um, uh, airborne transmission, as opposed to as, uh, as much concern about uh, somebody handing a clipboard and collecting signatures. Uh, Representative Vihovsky. The signature question actually was going to be my question. If we shorten that window to two weeks for some of these offices, that's an awfully short time to collect the amount of signatures that you need. So I was going to ask about the potential of if we shorten that time, you know, is it possible to to waive signatures? Just thinking about the variety of people running for a variety of offices, that's a really short window if you're someone who's working and, and then needs to collect hundreds of signatures as well. Well, first of all, legislators don't have to collect hundreds of signatures. You only have to collect 50 uh, in the House and 100 in the, in the Senate. Uh, it's the, the, the six statewide positions and the three federal or 
in this case, this year it will be two federal positions, uh, have to have 500. Um, so those are, the, those are the amounts of signatures that are required. I think everybody is expecting that, that uh, uh, the COVID transmissions will be much reduced by April. Uh, in fact, most of the experts I've been seeing and watching uh, have been saying that they expect this peak to be in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then this decline to start to happen. Is that going to happen? We don't know. Um, but um, I think so, it's it's more important to have the signature filings for the general and and the primary, uh, essentially for minor and and, and um, um, for the minor the major party candidates than it is uh, otherwise, because really what the signatures are supposed to be signifying to you are the strength of that candidacy, uh, that, that that person has some support from around the state. Uh, if it's, you know, if you have 500 signatures, you're pretty much going to get signatures from almost every county. If you have, if you only need 50 signatures as in a, in a state house race, you only need to get them uh, from your district. Um, and I think things will be a lot different by April than they are now. Everything will, will start to be outside and, and, and whatever. Uh, again, this is a legislative decision. It's not my decision to make. Um, I'm just I'm here to just tell you what the impacts might be uh, as, as we go down the line here. And I think that the, the waving of signatures, I do find it ironic that this year, Last year, there was a lot of pushback on both sides about waving of signatures. This year, it seems like people are starting to push for waving of signatures. So um, anyway, I just wanted to say that. Can I just ask a quick follow up? Yep. Uh, if it just so I hear you're really focused on some like the federal and the statewide seats, would we be able to hold those like keep those signatures and wave other signatures or would it have to be just across the board either they're waved or they're not that's i think amarin would be the one that you know it, it's a it's a question of the law and if if the legislature were to pass a law that says statewide uh, legislative candidates do not have to file um and then and then the um statewide do that would be your your discretion. I mean, it would be your, the legislature would have to pass that. And would that, from your perspective of sort of crowding the ballot, do you think that would solve that problem? Not really. I think, I think, I think, I think that if you, if you waive the signatures um, on legislative seats, you're probably going to have a lot more people who are running than, uh, than you would normally have. Now, that's not a bad thing to get more people involved. Don't get me wrong. But I, I think you need to understand the impacts uh, of the waving of signatures. So anyway. And has there been any further exploration to electronic signature collection? I know that that was a discussion last year as well, but I don't know where it landed, or two years ago, but I don't know where it landed. Um, we have not done anything further than that on that because basically with our small team of elections people, we, we've been really focused on, we've got new tabulators coming. Uh, we had to focus on the mail-in vote last year. We just didn't have any time. And uh, uh, so anyway, all I can say is that no, we don't, we haven't done anything in that air, that regard as far as moving towards it. And it would really be too late to, to capture uh, the, the, and I do, Representative Vyhoski, I, I wanna make sure that I, I'm clear. People, you could still send out a petition to an email list, but ask them to fill it out and mail it back to you. Um, and we do require the permanent, the the original signature. We don't we don't go. I mean, we don't because we don't have anything in law right now. That's that's part of it. But it, there's nothing that says you can't send something out to someone. Uh, I know I've done it. I've sent it to party chairs around the state and said, if you could pass this along at, at your uh, committee meetings, uh, I'd appreciate it. Then mail it back to me at my address. And, and you know, I've done that before. So the, the problem you have and the reason why we settle on April 1st is, as that deadline. And, and really, this is more, I think, 
I, I don't want to slight the Senate, but I think it's more important impacting on the on the House because of the sheer numbers um, of of representatives versus the senators uh, in, in trying to come up with the final plan um, is that that the the um, the legislature needs to try to move this as quickly as possible and not just pass it out of the House to the Senate, but pass it out of the House and the Senate and get it to the governor's desk. Because then you only have three weeks until that, that first deadline. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, Secretary Condos. Um, again, we're not in a, a presidential year, uh, which I think is a good thing. Um, I am concerned about uh, extending the timeline. I know 10 years ago, the final bill was passed uh, by the House and Senate on April 27th, I believe. The governor signed it, I think the 1st of May, somewhere in there. Um, so again, uh, I don't see a big problem with uh, uh, cutting right now, if we can, if we can gain two weeks, uh, and I and uh, a question would be, um, you know, now rather than later to give people enough advance notice, but uh, a two week decrease uh, in that filing petition uh, date from April twenty fifth to May twenty sixth, uh, I don't think would be a problem in my mind. But uh, uh, again, uh, I. And knowing what we went through 10 years ago and, and coming up with that final on that date, that there was a lot of work in there. And uh, again, we're behind the eight ball this year. So that's that's my comments. And, and thank you, Representative Higley. I, I, I do want to say that, uh, and I want to be clear that the filing period for petitions, you don't have to collect your signatures during that period. You only have to file them with us during that period. So once you have your districts set, people can go out and start. I mean, if, if we knew this, if you knew your districts right now, you could go out and get signatures right now. Uh, it's just the filing period is shortened up to four weeks and you could shorten that up to two weeks. Uh, that, that would not be an issue either. So um, we had this, I think we had this discussion when we went, when we moved this and shortened it to four weeks. So uh, it, that's not un, uh, that's that, that that's doable. And I think that uh, uh, you know it's something that if you want to pick up a couple of weeks, the problem is don't get a false sense of security that that means you can delay getting a bill passed for two more weeks. Uh, you still have to get it through the House and the Senate and get it signed by the governor, and p then the, then the parties have to recruit candidates and people have to go out and get signatures. Yes, so this is an important conversation to have so that we can be thinking about what we might want to have in our back pocket to um, to buy ourselves some time later on. I, 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 In my mind, it doesn't change the urgency of needing to get this initial bill out so that communities can start the process of giving us uh, official feedback. Um, we're Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Mr. Secretary of State. And I just want to say that I, I appreciate your comment about the fact that the House does very thorough and the majority of the work compared to the Senate. Um, I, I do agree with that. Um, my question is just briefly, though, is because it is an off year as far as it's a non-presidential election, how much of a change in work for, I guess, your office and others out there would you say you could expect? Jim, I mean, does it change that dramatically or you still have to print the same number of ballots regardless of who's on them? Well, it, it, really, there isn't a whole lot of change because the, as far as these dates, because uh, in a presidential year, the presidential primary is town meeting day. Uh, and then we know, we know what's going to happen after that. So that, that is basically set to the, to the statewide or to the general election. Once that happens, um, the only thing we have to have deal with is, is uh, independent and minor party uh, additions at that point. So it's really not that much. I mean, and again, the presidential, we had 20 this past year, we had 20, uh, 20 candidates that were listed or 20 teams that were listed. So um, it just, it, it makes for a lengthier ballot. And then if you start looking 
as Representative Hooper knows, you look at the Burlington ballot for JPs, uh, and there's, you know, pick 15, and you're picking 15 out of about 65 names that are on that ballot. They all, they take up almost the whole backside of the ballot just just for their names. Uh, so it's not it, it's it's not a um, I, I wouldn't say that there's a great reduction uh, this year for the primary and the general election. We will have new tabulators uh, brought out to the uh, uh, to the town clerks that, that you, for the districts that use tabulators. Uh, so we ha we do have some training that we have to do uh, this summer um, prior to the statewide primary, uh, but that'll be in addition to some of the other issues. Um, Anyway, I hope that answers Thank your you. question. Yes. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. And, and by the way, I, I do want to add, um, because both Representative Higley and, and Representative LeClaire uh, raised the issue, actually I raised it about the Senate versus the House. Uh, I was in the Senate and I was a member of the Senate redistricting team in 2001 and two, and we did not, get the final plan out and 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 deputy secretary chris winters knows this because he was the uh, uh director for opr uh but we did not get the plan out uh and finalize it until i think it was june 13th that year uh the the legislature the senate held the opr bill as the last bill that needed to be passed so that they could attach the redistricting bill to that. And, um, and, and so that's where that went, but that's just a, an aside. Fascinating, holding the OPR bill hostage. <laughs> I bet that puts you on the hot seat. Uh, Representative Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Condos. Um, so I just had a procedural question. So I have been approached by many people running for statewide or higher office collecting signatures now because regardless of what we do, they won't change. Um, you know, the state will still remain the state. Um, but what happens if someone wanted to go out and start collecting signatures now because there's more than 50 people in every town um, just to get ahead of the game? Because um, you're at least are going to have your hometown. But for those hometowns that are divided, are you guys gonna make people sign like what street they live on to make sure they're on the right side of the districts or um, just thinking forward that way? So you're right about the statewides. The statewides could start collecting right now um, because their district is the state of Vermont. So that's that's correct. The statewides are all set uh, in terms of this. It's the, it's the Senate and the House districts depending on what you guys do with those districts, because if you, it, it, it's, and it's not our office that checks those, it's, it's the, the uh, dis, uh, district clerks that, that will check those addresses, and they do have to check to see if someone is living within that district. So they're going to be, they're going to probably be checking at that point uh, to make sure that the, the, the person, so if, if for instance, one side of the street is in one district and the other side of the street is in another district, you can't count the ones that are in the wrong district to that person. So, um, and, and if you start, if someone said, well, I'm, I'm pretty safe, so I'm going to go ahead and start collecting now, but the district name and number changes, that negates, you can't just cross it out and put the correct district on it. You have to you have to go out and get a new petition started. So that's why it's important to get the districts set in place. Um, and and <laughs> uh, having been through this twice before, I do know that um, the that ledge council has to, they have to verbally describe each of the districts to put into statute. So they have to do it in words. It's easy to do it on a map. Try putting it in words. Thank you. Yeah, we saw some of that today at a very high level um, of just, you know, this part of town, or this town, not part of this map. Um, but I was just trying to put it on record and for people that might be trying to jump ahead that 
the state, you know, if you're running for a statewide office, you're good to get your signatures because that just has the town that you reside in, not your, you know, specific street. But if you are in a town, don't assume you're safe um, because your town could be divided into uh, between rivers and valleys. So thank right. you. Representative Yehovsky. Thank you. Changing that subject a little bit, um, Secretary Condos, you said that um, if we went to all single member districts, there would be an increase in cost for your office. Do you by any chance have even a rough estimate of what the increase in cost for each additional district would be? No. Okay. No, and, and a lot of it will be in time involved uh, as well. But uh, keep in mind, we have to send this stuff to the printers and the printers have to set up their systems to be able to print each of the ballots um, and then mail it out to the district clerk. Yeah, no, it certainly makes sense that there would be an increase in cost. I was just trying to get a sense of every additional district costs what, but you don't know. So thank you. We, we haven't, we haven't even tried to calculate that. <clears throat> Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Secretary Condos, I had mentioned it maybe before you came on and it looks like Deputy Secretary Winters is going to, provide it for us, but uh, I, I would like to have that timeline that I believe you were reading from as well uh, presented to us if, if we could get it, uh, uh, because it's hard for me. I've written it down again, but um, I, I certainly would like to look at what you're looking at so that I can explain it to other other reps. So appreciate that. That's one of the reasons why I was late getting on. I was actually <laughs> preparing that timeline so I could recite it to you folks. Uh, so I, I've got it right here and uh, uh, I can send it to Andrea and then she can uh, uh, distribute it to the rest of you. Thank you very much. That would be very helpful. Um, committee members, any other questions for the fine folks from the Secretary of State's office? All right. Um, uh, Chris and Jim, thank you so much for being uh, uh, very responsive this morning and jumping in and answering questions for us. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for your work. All right. So committee, um, let's take a 15 minute break at this point and we'll come back at 11 for some Good morning. You are back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we have been doing some work this morning on the initial redistricting bill um, and coming back for a little bit of uh, committee discussion. <coughs> um, for committee members who haven't uh, refreshed their agenda, um, we are uh, I have added um, Tucker Anderson to our agenda this afternoon um, at one o'clock to go over the town meeting bill. Um, I hear from the Senate that they will be um, voting it out uh, when they go on to the floor this afternoon at one and, um, and we'll be suspending rules to message it over to us so that we can make quick work of it. Um, and so I wanted Tucker to get in this afternoon to, um, to, to familiarize us with what is in the bill so that we can hopefully make really quick work on that and turn it around. Um, we don't have a floor session planned in the house until Friday. And so I've been in contact with the speaker's office about, um, about how that is going to work in terms of the bill being uh, assigned to us and then um, how quickly we can turn around and send it back out. Um, anyone have questions about the town meeting bill? Rep Merwicki. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you. Given what you've just said is the earliest timeline then that we get the bill, introduce it on month, on Friday, and then we could vote it out next Tuesday. Um, or is there another way? That is one possible timeline. There are other possible timelines. Um, if, for instance, the speaker wanted to take a 15 minute recess off the floor of the house, um, after it's been assigned to us and give us time to, um, to do our official 
vote on it. Uh, that gives us the rest of the day today and all day tomorrow to familiarize ourselves with it. And, and I think that um, we, have, uh, we have plenty of folks that we can hear from um, uh, and we will hear from tomorrow. Uh, well, actually, I think we have them on the schedule for Friday, <laughs> but <clears throat> depending on how we do at moving our initial redistricting plan, we might be able to bump uh, some of this town meeting bill consideration to, um, to tomorrow. And, you know, I guess I would just invite folks to tell me how, you know, how deep a dive do you feel you need to go in terms of hearing from every single person? Uh, entity who, um, you know, who's going to come in and tell us this is really important to get out um, before, uh, before towns need to warn their, their town meetings. Sarah, I haven't looked at the Senate bill, but is it much different than what we passed last year? Um, I think it is largely the same, um, with the exception of adding that clarification that um, communities can't use Australian ballot to choose to do Australian ballot forever and ever. In other words, communities who before the pandemic still had an in-person town meeting have to go to an in-person meeting uh, in order to decide to do, uh, to do their business in a different format. And I think everything else about it is <clears throat> is largely the same as we saw last year with, um, you know, giving towns the flexibility to go to Australian ballot or delay the date of their vote and giving the directing the Secretary of State's office to issue, um, you know, procedures and, and protocols on how to do that. Uh, Representative Anthony. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Not to speak for her, but uh, Clerk uh, uh, Dawes, I know is eager to come in at our convenience and I bet she'd come in tomorrow, later today, whatever you think wise. Um, yeah, and I, as far as I hear, uh, she had a few minor tweaks, but uh, you know, she, otherwise she's uh, supportive and I believe her association is also, but not to speak for her. Yeah, I hope if she has a tweak that she has expressed that on the Senate side and that they have made the changes there because yeah. um, obviously yeah. if we make a change to the bill, then it has no, to go no, back no. over to no, she, the process. She's, she, she knows all about that. So uh, she'll yeah. either have it settled it or it's gone, one or the other. Uh, Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you. I have to say, I don't know about you that are on an iPad, but there's a little box that shows up where I can lower my hand and I don't have to look for it. But anyway, um, because we've already done this and are somewhat familiar with the language, I don't have any major concerns um, with what I'm hearing coming across for sure. The one thing that I have to ask though is based on our prior conversations with the Secretary of State and some concerns around timelines and things like that, should we seriously think about adding some other language to this to buy us some more time. Um, my, my fear is honestly that this April 1st deadline, I understand all the criteria and all the reasons why it needs to be done, but I would hate to see us get to the 11th hour and 59th minute and find out that there's something that isn't quite as it should be. And if there's some tweaks that we can make, some changes that we can make, to buy us a couple more weeks, um, I, I think it would behoove us to at least have that conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly happy to have that conversation, um, um, but I would prefer not to buy us that time in the town meeting bill. Okay. Um, because the town meeting bill does have um, such urgency to get it across the finish line so that communities can, um, can make their decisions and warn their their meetings, but uh, but we can certainly continue to talk about um, what we might want to do to <laughs> to ease a little bit of pressure on the on the back end of our um, redistricting timeline here in the House. Representative Merwicky, um, I I did want to be amenable to Rep. Le Leclerc's request there, but. Uh, I would have to trade him talking to my town clerks first and explaining to them why he wanted to do something that might delay the bill 
And uh, all three of them are very nice people, uh, but they are very adamant about they want this bill passed pretty darn fast. So if you'd like to talk to them for me, then we could talk about adding something onto the bill. I'm, I'm happy to bail you out anytime I can, Mike. <laughs> what are friends for? <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions about the town meeting bill? I, um, I have asked Andrea to invite the folks who are on our agenda for Friday morning to join us this afternoon at one when Tucker comes in. Uh, we really only have, you know, from one to... 155 if we want to if we want to bump right up against the governor's state of the state address um <clears throat> luckily you know the the beauty of zoom is that it's just a couple of computer clicks to get from committee to the house floor the virtual house floor to uh to listen to the governor's address so um <clears throat> in theory that should be fine for us to work right up until one and maybe we can feel comfortable that we're ready to uh, to give this bill the green light. Um, feel free to contact me if there's anything else that, uh, that you feel you need about the town meeting bill in order to get, get it out the door uh, ASAP. Um, let's see. So I wanted to go back to committee discussion about the redistricting bill and just um, we, uh, we, we gave um, Amron and Nick the request to, you know, go back and just make, uh, make certain that the narrative that we looked at um, corresponds to the, uh, the final alternative LAB map as we, uh, as we heard testimony on from uh, Jeannie Albert yesterday. Um, and we will have all morning tomorrow with uh, Tom Little, the chair of the Legislative Apportionment Board, to hopefully um, help us understand what is uh, what is in the narrative that will be coming from the LAB that can also, um, I think, enrich the community's consideration of this um, initial map proposal. So what else do you need? Uh, Representative Anthony. Uh, actually, nothing additional, but I wanted to key off your um strategy, and I, I agree, you use the phrase cordon off, uh, that is any of the other preliminary map steps to the most relevant recent Albert edition. I don't know how you cordon off, and I, I respect the uh, historical um, importance of seeing a transition, but if there's a way to remove the ones that are not for consideration, I don't know whether that's cordoning or not. I think it's important to preserve them as a historical record, but I really think having them up with the relevant ones is just asking for misunderstanding. Thanks. Yep, I think the probably the best way to tackle that, and I will talk with um, Andrea and Amarin after committee, is to go into the committee page and just rename the the what we know as you know previous versions or incorrect maps rename them something else so that it's clear when people are uh are looking at that that um that those aren't the drafts that they should be looking at and we also have the ability to some extent to use the sidebar on on our um committee page uh, for additional information. And I think uh, last year that was mostly populated with, um, with information on pensions because we were doing a lot of work on pensions throughout the session last year. So maybe in that additional information section, we can do something to highlight um, the, the redistricting initial proposal and, um, and some of the uh, some of the reference keys that are available to go along with that to make it easier for our colleagues to direct people. Representative LeClaire. Um, along that lines there, uh, Madam Chair, so would we say that this would be the primary source that people should go to to get as much current information as they can get around this as it's proceeding or 
I think once we have our documents um, correctly displayed, um, it will be the easiest way for people to get the, the okay. accurate information. It, you know, when you go to the LAB site, it's a little bit harder to navigate and a little bit more challenging to understand, you know, what you're looking at. And you have to, you have to kind of know the LAB timeline, because I think some of their documents are in chronological order. So, and I see Amarin's popped her screen back up. So maybe she's got some other thoughts on this. No, I, I would echo the same thoughts that you had, Madam Chair, about how we could organize the documents, just relabeling documents that are already on our webpage so it's clear those aren't the most current ones that the committee is reviewing, um, and then having, uh, um, if you wanted to have a particular section either in reports and, you know, some committee pages have kind of a reports and research page, we can have a reapportionment um, folder and subfolders in that, I believe, if we wanted to, but uh, I think we can accomplish, I think we can accomplish this and make it much easier for people to identify which are the most current maps and draft language that you are looking at. Go ahead. That, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, a follow-up question I have around that though is if we had somebody that was looking at this and trying to, to work with it, um, who would be their contact person or entity as far as getting clarification or giving some feedback? What kind of feedback? Can you give me a for instance on that? Uh, sure. I mean, you know, let's say that you have a, a board of civil authority that's very involved in this and is going through taking a look at the information and, you know, maybe it's changing from day to day. Um, is there a preferred way that they would give some feedback um because i can't imagine we're looking to say it's kind of once and done here you get your one shot and that's it so um you know are you looking for them to contact amarin are we looking for them to contact members of the committee uh, the chair it would seem that if we had uh, some clear lines of communication it would cut down on some confusion yeah, certainly contacting members of the committee is uh, is the way to go. Um, and I okay. wonder if it might if we might go so far as to um, create a legislative email address, you know, redistricting at ledge.state or whatever, you know, um, that would that would be uh, the place that communities could send that official feedback because while the statute says they are to respond to the house clerk, I believe. Um, uh, that's not in practice what has happened. It needs to get back to us. And, you know, folks, I suppose, could just look on the legislative website and send it to all members of the House Government Operations Committee, but, um, but perhaps we could make it a little easier for them. So I, I'll take a look at that and see if, see if I can find a way to streamline that. Seems like a really reasonable idea right there. I am glad you thought of it. No, you did. I'll give you all the credit for that. <laughs> uh, Rep. Lefebvre, you had your hand up. Do you have a question? No, I was just going to suggest we just had an email that everybody could go to so that way things didn't get lost or someone email one of us and it go to our spam folder. I'd feel pretty horrible if something got lost from a town. Um, and obviously not to overwhelm Amarin or the house clerk. Um, right. So. All right. Thank you. Well, I will um, put that on my list of things to do um, when we're between committee meetings. Um, find out what we can do for an email address. Uh, Rep. Pigley. Uh, in looking over the uh, letters from 10 years ago, um, they appear to be all addressed to uh, Betsy Ann Rask Legislative Council. So again, I don't know if that's what was on the initial uh, information that went out to these towns or not, but uh, that's what appears to, uh, to come back. And then for whatever reason, I have a copy of all those. So um, I don't know if, uh, to be honest with you, whether or not uh, Ledge Council printed those out for us or uh, did uh, send them to our emails or whatever, but um, 
Yeah, and and some of them are actually to Betsy Ann and Michael Chernick. So just just to just to be aware, I guess. All right. So what else would committee members um, like to cover in advance of or uh, before we are ready to move this bill out? Um, we we have a, a good three hour chunk of time tomorrow morning, um, which we could use, you know, entirely with uh, with the chair of the LAB or we could hear from other folks if people feel they need to hear from other folks. And I see Peter Anthony hitting buttons. So go right ahead, Representative Anthony. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, uh, I think uh, I would feel more comfortable <clears throat> if I could uh, review that, um, feel comfortable uh, with the uh, sort of narrative that we uh, discussed uh, that would go out, whether that is lifted from uh, the work of Tom Little and that, and that committee, or we also ask uh, Ms. Albert to create uh, something that goes along with the uh, most recent uh, iteration. I just, um, I would like to use some of that time uh, to look at, uh, not necessarily on screen, but have in advance uh, so that we can have a discussion about the narrative, uh, at whatever, whatever shape that takes. Whether it's regional, statewide, I, I'm, I just suggested regional, but it doesn't have to be. Um, all right, I, I will see it ahead. That's all. I will check in and see what the time frame is for the creation of that narrative, um, um, and also, um, you know, we had talked earlier about asking um, Nick to prepare a, a regional. Um, blow up for each district so that when we send um, when we send this out to districts for feedback that they would be able to see the surrounding districts as well so that they can um, offer helpful feedback that doesn't you know doesn't necessarily create a domino effect I, of I totally of, agree and the choice of what how Nick scopes it out would frame the narrative in one sense, uh, because obviously talking about an area that's not related to that region would be just a waste of time and attention and space. So what Nick decides is a, is a workable compact um, unit for focus should drive in some sense, the selection of, uh, of narrative scope. I think that my gut would be to share the entire narrative um, with everyone as opposed to trying to have us, you know, dedicate staff time to, uh, you know, to sectioning out just the part that pertains. Um, you know, it, it's not as if we're having to physically mail these packages so that, you know, that we're trying to keep it from being 70 pages long. <laughs> um, I think we can probably transmit most of this electronically um, and uh, and therefore, you know, sharing the entire narrative. You know, um, it's helpful, I think, for communities to be able to see what's happening in other parts of the state as well. Um, certainly to the extent that, you know, uh, you know, they may see that there are other communities who are in similar circumstances to them and and um, and and may find solace in that or or um or may team up with other communities and say let's advocate for something different uh so let's let them all have the whole thing i think uh representative lafayette thank you madam chair would we be able to hear from somebody from the majority map that isn't mr little tomorrow for a brief amount of time um just to give respect to the work that they put in um, I know that we have heard um, from the creator of the map that we have chosen, and I know that Mr. Little has touched base on it in December, and I know he'll be speaking to us tomorrow, um, but I do feel that it was the one that was picked um, 
buyback committee and they would just give a little bit of perspective. I do know that was the map that BCAs had already been able to look at and give feedback on. And I respect that by the minority map going out, it will also give towns opportunity to comment on that in addition to what they already have done. Um, I just think that it'd be respectful and make my conscience feel much better that, that we had them come in to give their story as well. Um, I'm happy to consider uh, doing a deeper dive on the majority map uh, after we've got this initial map out and, and maybe in the interim between now and when we start hearings with the boards of civil authority. Um, but I don't feel like it's critical to our understanding of what we're moving out for input from the BCAs that we do a deep dive on that right now. Representative LeClaire. Um. <clears throat> It is my understanding there, Madam Chair, that I think that the LAB, they're taking a formal vote. Is it either yesterday or today, I believe, on the narratives on one or both maps? Um, at least that's my understanding, but I, I'm not wrong, but I could be mistaken. I can't tell you that I know on off the top of my head what the LAB um, timeline is, but I have noticed in the past that sometimes when we utter questions like this out loud, there's a certain member of our committee who's already begun looking it up and, and we'll pipe in in just a moment. Representative Gannon. <laughs> Representative LeClaire is correct. They, they had a meeting starting at 9 a.m. this morning. Um, and they had one on Monday as well. So um, hold on. Um, so what's the prize I get for getting the right answer on Hollywood Squares here? <laughs> yes. Uh, hold on. Uh. Oh, that's wrong, Dave. So they do have draft language. Um, yeah, they're operating under uh, under the same sort of time crunch that we are, and, and yeah. are struggling to get the narratives. I, I I think it's interesting that they're doing narratives for both uh, the the adopted map and the alternate map, which. Um, you know, I think it, that's very helpful. Okay, they they are delay they delayed release of the reports um, until action today. Um, so they'll be voting them out today. Great. So possibly by the time we get back into committee this afternoon, we will know that those are done and up on the LAB site. Thank you, Representative Gannon and Rep LeClaire for that great question. Um, so we can, uh, I think, wrap committee for the morning unless other folks have questions or, um, or comments. Representative Higley. I'm not sure I can see much of Representative LeClaire anymore. His head looks like it's really too big for the screen right now. I think he got Is two compliments possible? in one day. <laughs> <laughs> Is that possible? It's, uh, I, I, I understand that you need to get a copy of today's Times Argus in order to really appreciate the beauty <laughs> and just for this committee only, I will autograph it for free. Oh, good. Oh, good. I needed something to hang on my wall right over here. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think that kind of wraps the work that we have here this morning. And again, um, we will dive into the town meeting bill this afternoon. Um, and I've asked Andrea if she can uh, let all of the folks know who we had invited to testify on Friday morning about the town meeting bill or Friday afternoon, I guess, uh, let them know that we'd like them to come today if they can. 
um, the speaker's answer to me on timing was, um, we want you to get it out ASAP. So if we are feeling comfortable with it, if we feel like we've uh, heard from um, the number of folks that we need to, to, to move the bill out, we could ask the speaker to take a recess uh, during the floor on Friday morning and you know after the bill's been assigned to us so that we could turn around and, and vote it back out. So I just wanna make sure that we use our time today and tomorrow um, as efficiently as possible to, um, you know, to try to get ourselves ready to move that bill on Friday. <clears throat> uh, Representative Anthony. So uh, if I understand correctly, folks who could not come say between one and two today could come tomorrow morning at, at a time uh, convenient uh, to carve out to uh, lay, lay any uh, last minute unease about um, essentially having a preliminary vote before we have possession? Well, we, <clears throat> we have some flexibility in our schedule tomorrow. We have uh, the chair of the LAB tomorrow morning. I don't expect we're going to need him for three hours, but maybe we will. Um, <clears throat> and then we have, the only thing we have on our schedule for tomorrow afternoon is possible markup and vote of this redistricting bill. So we, uh, in theory, that's not going to take us all afternoon. Um, because uh, what we really need to make sure is that the the bill language matches the map version that we <laughs> intended to put out and that we have, um, you know, that we feel comfortable that we have all of the uh, supporting documents uh, in one place so that we know what we're moving out for communities to respond to. So in theory, we should have some time tomorrow afternoon as well. And um, so we can <clears throat> we can work on figuring out what uh, what time tomorrow afternoon we could come back to the town meeting bill. Okay, I'll convey that. And Representative Gannon. Um, for people who want to get a head start on, on the town meeting bill, it is on the Senate GovOps website. It's um, S-172 as recommended by the Senate GovOps committee. So um, anybody that wants to take a look at it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Excellent. Um, any other questions, comments, requests on either of the two bills that we're going to try to move out this week? Super. Not seeing anybody diving in for their little yellow hands. So um, I think that that is all we have on our um, on our docket this morning and we will come back into committee at one to do. Amarin, is there anything else that you um, wanted to direct us to or, or point out to us? Nope. Okay, great. Uh, John Gannon. Thank you. I just had one question for Amarin. Um, why in the um, redistricting bill are we striking out the existing districts? I mean, why don't we just have the new districts? Is that just for people so they understand it better? Or? Why are we striking out? You Oh, you mean the districts? Why not leave the district names and just do line edits yeah. within each district for the changes? Is well, I question? mean, you have... 35 pages of the bill, which are strikeouts. Mm -hmm. So why the, do we need that? <laughs> um, well, one, the district names, as you may have seen in, in today's new language, to some extent are changing. Right. So to keep the district names and just alter towns within each district will create a very, uh, confusing, I think, overall draft for people looking at this. Um, if you have a district name changing plus um, town, some towns staying, some leaving because of the order of how we, uh, in our drafting manual, how we delete, the order of which we delete things and insert things, it would become very messy very quickly, I think, and be difficult to read. So the initial districts, which are in there currently, um, 
the easiest, the most simple way to do it from a reading it perspective is to delete what's there and put in what's new, recognizing that some of it is in fact the same or th in theory would be the same and is the same maybe in, in this draft. There are some districts that are unchanged for, for sure. Okay. I, I just, I don't know if that is, is helpful. There are, we could do it differently. Um, if you, if you would like to see it done differently, this is, I think the way we have typically done it in the past. Okay. I, I mean, I'm just, I just want to make sure I understood, um, because I mean, you know, basically driving people to what is, I think page 35 is where you start really getting into the meat of the bill. That's just a lot of stuff too. It is. <laughs> So when, when we're reporting this bill on the floor of the house, we'll begin by saying, and now on page 37. That's right. <laughs> That's the best kind of 44 page bill to report on the floor of the house. Yeah. So it's not a big deal. I just, just want to understand. Well, and I think it's also sort of slightly unsettling to see that we're moving a bill that eliminates all of our districts. You know, it's sort of like, Okay, we're out at the end of the diving board and and we have now jumped. We have uh, we will have passed a bill that um, you know that strikes through all of the current districts and then we're uh, we're really uh, committed to getting new district lines drawn before adjournment. All right, any other questions? All right. Thank you for your good work this morning, committee. You know where to find me if you have any questions or requests during lunchtime. And um, we are going to sign off now until one o'clock.